Well, thank you very much, Paul, for that uh, overly gracious introduction. I'm not exactly sure who you were talking about, but, uh, but I'll take it. Uh, you know, for those of you in the audience who are not Houstonians, you should know that uh, Paul and Janet Hobby and the entire Hobby family have really helped shape the destiny of Houston and Texas for decades and decades and decades. And I will tell you, Paul, it is one of my great honors to be your friend. And I thank you for everything you have done for the McRaven family. Thanks so very, very much. I would also like to take a moment and, uh, and thank the Gold Star families that are here uh, and, and to echo Robin's words. You should know that the Navy SEAL Foundation and the Navy SEALs are always here for you and we really, truly appreciate your incredible sacrifice, the sacrifice of your loved ones, and we are here for you forever. So thank you so very, very much. And I also want to recognize I also want to recognize uh, my good friend and Medal of Honor recipient, Tommy Norris, who sits here. For those of you SEALs that uh, are younger, uh, you know when you walked through the halls of Bud's training, you saw pictures of the Medal of Honor recipients. Well, when I went through in 1977, there were three, and Tommy was one of them. And Tommy is what inspired me every day as I was going through SEAL training. And if ever there was a SEAL gentleman, ever a SEAL warrior, ever the gold standard for being a Navy SEAL, it is Tommy Norris. And sir, thank you so very, very much. Well, when Robin asked me to speak at the Navy SEAL Foundation event this year, I was really thrilled to hear that it was going to be in Houston. And while I have always appreciated the wonderful support and the reception the Navy SEAL Foundation gets in New York City and elsewhere, having the opportunity to bring this event to my home state was special for me. So once again, let me thank all of those of you in the Foundation staff and those of you here in Houston who have done such a magnificent job of bringing this event together and particularly to all of those sponsors who have contributed to make this, uh, this incredible event uh, here tonight. So again, thank you so very, very much. In 1975, I was a sophomore at the University of Texas going through the Naval ROTC program. And we had a Navy co-op, a house, where a bunch of the midshipmen lived. And it was called the Crow's Nest. Now think. Animal House meets Stripes. We were not exactly beloved by the ROTC staff because the graduation rate of those midshipmen living in the crow's nest was, shall we say, not exactly up to the Navy standard. At one point in time, I had the highest GPA in the house at 2.1, and I was damn proud of it. <laughs> so on occasion, in order to build bridges with the ROTC staff, the active duty guys, we would host parties at the Crow's Nest and invite the officers and senior enlisted over from the ROTC unit. And back then, the drinking age was 18, so we could all imbibe. Well, one of the officers from the ROTC unit was a highly decorated Marine Lieutenant Colonel who had seen a lot of combat in Vietnam. Now, those of us who wanted to be Marines or SEALs would sit at the feet of the Colonel and listen to his war stories. And he never glorified his experience on the battlefield. In fact, his stories were raw and unvarnished. And with every additional sip of the Jim Beam, the pain of the combat losses was apparent. And with every drag on his unfiltered camel cigarette, the missed family time, the long deployments, the sacrifice of his Marines weighed more and more on him. He tried in every fashion to explain what war was really all about. But when you're 19, 19 years old like most of us were, and you want to be a warrior, you view things differently. Then in April 1975 came the end of the Vietnam War. There were those horrendous photos and those scenes of helicopters evacuating Americans off the roof of the U.S. Embassy in Saigon. The party that weekend took on an entirely different tone. The colonel reflected on his time in Vietnam. He had no regrets. 
He was a professional soldier who had done the best job he could. He mourned for those he lost. He prayed for their families. But in the end, he was comforted with the knowledge that he served with honor and integrity. The pride in his fellow Marines and their service was unwavering. I never forgot the Colonel's assessment of his service in Vietnam. And I would revisit that assessment again later in my career. But at the time, with the Vietnam War ending, I also feared that my opportunity to be a warrior was over. The longest war in American history was finished. Surely, it would be a long time before we were in conflict again. Surely, America would revert back inside its borders and hope that the world would find peace. Surely, that would happen. But the Colonel, always a student of history, told us that America had never gone longer than 10 years without being in a conflict, that the storms that the storm clouds of war were always on the horizon, and that as part of us, of us warriors, we needed to be prepared always. Our time would come, and we had better be ready. Four years later, 52 Americans were taken hostage in Tehran. Four years after that, we invaded Grenada to free American students and rid the island of Russians and Cubans. Five years after that, we invaded Panama to rescue Americans and rid the country of Noriega. Two years later came Desert Storm in 1991, then Bosnia in 1992, then Black Hawk Down in 1993, then Kosovo in 1998, and then 2001. And for the next 20 years after 2001, Americans and our allies fought in Iraq and Afghanistan and Yemen, Somalia, North Africa, Syria, the Philippines, and places that will remain classified for a long time. Last 4th of July, I was in Coronado, California. I took the opportunity to visit the old UDT SEAL compound where I first served in 1978. The building, an old World War II era one-story cinder block structure, was still standing. And walking through its halls was kind of like a black and white visit down memory lane. In my mind, I could see the old Vietnam vets dressed in their blue and gold t-shirts and khaki swim trunks. I could smell the neoprene from the wetsuits that hung on the pull-up bar. I could hear the laughter coming from the PT circle and the good nature of harassment. I could see the faces, now long gone, that guided me through my early years in the teams. But as I was there wandering through the halls, the current commander of the basic SEAL training saw me and asked me to come talk to one of the classes that was in session. The current training center is being demolished and a new building is going up in its place. And the training center had taken over these old SEAL buildings as makeshift classrooms. As I walked into the classroom, the students jumped up and came to attention. They were all young and fit with a burr haircut and had a look of determination in their eye. I was pleased to see that after 45 years, we were still getting the same kind of man. But after I gave a few comments, one of the young trainees asked about the future of the SEALs. He said, hey, sir, we've left Iraq. We're getting ready to leave Afghanistan. All the wars are winding down. So what's next for us? I could only smile and think back to that day in the crow's nest. So I recounted the story of the Marine Colonel and his counsel to his young midshipmen. I told the SEAL trainees to get ready, to always be prepared that you never know when the next war is coming. That was last summer. Now, eight months later, we sit on the precipice of war again. As 100,000 Russian troops line the border of Ukraine, their artillery aimed at Kiev, their jets marshaled on the tarmac, and their ships sortine towards the North Atlantic. In the air over Taiwan, an armada of Chinese fighters and bombers routinely threatens their neighbors. A cold war is upon us, a cold war that could, could turn hot at any minute. History has a way of repeating itself. And what history teaches us about war is that without the support of the people at home, the strongest armies in the world will not be victorious. From the earliest Chinese writings on warfare, General Sun Tzu understood that without the nation behind the war and the warrior, victory was impossible. Prussian General Carl von Clausewitz, Admiral Alfred Thayer Mahan, Du Hay, Liddell Hart, every great military strategist, every practitioner and thinker on the subject of war always understood the importance of the citizens 
who stood by their warriors. In 1975, as the soldiers returned from Vietnam, they were spit upon, vilified, and left to wonder, was it all worth it? Fortunately, times have changed. Since then, the American people, even those who didn't believe in the conflict, have always supported our soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines. This support is the single most important aspect in a warrior's life. Without the support of the American people, without the support of their families, their churches, their friends, then the sacrifice becomes hollow and gut-wrenching. But with the support, these young men and women will carry the banner of freedom until their last breath. Several years ago, I was fortunate to be on a Southwest Airlines plane during an honor flight. These honor flights take veterans from Central Texas to Washington, D.C. to visit the memorials and then return them to Austin. I just happened to be leaving D.C., heading home, when I realized I was about to board an honor flight. It was one of the most inspirational moments and times in my life. At Reagan National Airport, hundreds of people, most of whom didn't know the veterans, lined up along the corridor leading to the departure gate. American flags were hung everywhere, and someone in the honor flight staff had given small flags to people in the crowd. As I waited down the corridor, I could hear the applause long before the veterans arrived at the gate. People shouting, clapping, a small two-man band leading the men in their wheelchairs to the departure area. As they arrived, everyone in the terminal came to their feet. Civilians saluted, hugged them. Little children reached out to touch them. The applause continued as they boarded the plane. On the flight to Austin, the old boys, veterans of World War II, Korea, and Vietnam reminisced with each other. The flight attendants gave them special attention, and as the seatbelt sign came off, passengers from throughout the cabin came to pay their respects. Then midway through the flight, the Southwest Airlines crew and the honor flight staff held mail call. The vets had no idea that their families and friends had written them letters of thanks. As the letters were passed out, As the letters were passed out and read quietly by each veteran, the tears flowed unabated. Thanks came from their kids, pictures from their grandkids, notes from perfect strangers who had volunteered to write. When we arrived in Austin, the reception was equally enthusiastic. The passengers on the plane disembarked first, but not a one of them left the gate area. The passengers, along with hundreds of others, waited at the gate until the veterans began to offload. The applause was deafening. From around the airport, people came. Shouts of USA, USA rang out. The long line of wheelchair-bound veterans made their way to the baggage claim area where banners were hung, where flags were flying, where family and friends waited. And the clapping continued. For those men and women who served, who gave so very much, nothing, absolutely nothing in the world could replace that feeling of being appreciated. Finally, when a SEAL, a soldier, a Marine, an airman, or a sailor dies in combat, we have a ramp ceremony to return them home to their loved ones. A C-17 cargo plane lands in the middle of the night to avoid enemy surface search, surface air missiles. The plane will taxi to a spot on the runway and lower its ramp. Soon after landing, SEALs or soldiers from the Fallen Units, Fallen Heroes Unit will form an honor guard, two long lines extending from the back of the ramp. All along the airfield, hundreds of people will come to pay their respects. 
civilians and military alike, all standing at attention. Then at the appointed hour, a Humvee carrying the flag-draped casket of a fallen hero will arrive. Six pallbearers will lift the casket from the bed of the Humvee and carry it through the long honor guard into the cargo bay. There they will come to attention, salute, pay their final respects, salute again, and depart. Then the other SEALs or soldiers will, flop, will flow into the cargo bay for the final goodbye. And at that point, a priest or a minister or a rabbi will say a prayer and a quote from the Bible. It is always the same quote, Isaiah 6, 8. And then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, here am I, send me. Here am I, send me. Send me to Iraq, send me to Afghanistan, send me to Mogadishu and Somalia, send me to Kosovo and Bosnia, send me to Panama and Vietnam, send me to Korea, to the Pacific, send me to Normandy and to the Marne, send me wherever the nation needs me and I will do my duty. They say send me because they believe. They believe that we are the greatest nation on the face of the earth. And they will always say send me as long as the people of this great nation believe in them and support them. Plato once said that only the dead have seen the end of war. Those young SEALs who stood in the classroom in Coronado last summer are probably gearing up for the next fight. They are on the grinder every day getting strong. They are honing their tactical skills. They are talking to the old veterans who fought in Iraq and Afghanistan. They will be worried about a lot of things. Will they have the courage to fight? Will they lead their SEALs well? Will they live or die with honor? But the one thing they won't worry about is whether their family at home will be taken care of. They won't worry because they know the Navy SEAL Foundation will be there to help them in so very many ways. The support you provide isn't about the money. The money's important, but what's truly important is the knowledge that people care. The great British philosopher G.K. Chesterton once said that true soldier fights the true soldier fights not because he hates what's in front of him, but because he loves what's behind him. As SEALs, we are so very fortunate to know that all of you who support the Navy SEAL Foundation are firmly behind us, always there, always ready to lend a hand, always there to support us, always there when we need you. Thank you all so very, very much for being here tonight. And thank you for supporting the foundation and everything that it does. Thank you.